think this is a topic that um, a lot of people are interested in and sparks a lot of conversation. And I've got some thoughts on it, but I've got way more thoughts than I can possibly uh, present in just a little while. So if you want to ask questions and you want it to go a slightly different direction, I'm happy to do that. Um, so what I wanted to talk about was, because we're talking in the midst of a crisis and a lot of people are doing virtual work, um, how we can build and create them to be the most inclusive environments we possibly can. Um, sure, okay. So we have some challenges when it comes to inclusion in a virtual environment. Uh, we know that historically marginalized people, they're already challenged by creating those network relationships. So um, they've got already have struggles around who they're connected to and how strong that connection is and the structure of that connection. I'm going to talk about those in just a second. But when it comes to being integrated and fully embedded in the network in an organization, historically marginalized people are already at a disadvantage. And those of you who have heard me talk before know what a fan I am of uh, creating an effective network and also know that there's such decades and decades of research that support the connection between having an effective network, having the right connections in the right way, and everything from promotions to uh, job opportunities to pay, people who have the certain structures get paid more, they're more likely to be tapped for top talent, they're more likely to be involved in innovation, um, there's also, they're more likely to live longer. We find that the impact of networks on people's um, physical health is more than that of obesity and smoking combined. Um, so they're very powerful, whether you're talking about it in your sort of personal social life or you're talking about it in your workplace relationships. And so it really matters how you structure that network and how people are connected to each other. Um, I go into organizations a lot and some of the metrics that they typically use to understand how well they're doing with really inclusion is they look at representation at different levels in the organization and that's a fine statistic and they also take a look at feelings of inclusion usually feelings of engagement that a lot of them um, have been doing the gallup survey for for years um, and they look at those two things to see well are we doing okay with bringing diversity throughout the organization, and are we doing okay with having people believe that they're uh, included throughout the organization? And those are certainly very good measures. Um, but what I'm not seeing, or I'm starting to see more and more of, is an understanding if people, how interwoven are they in the set of workplace relationships? Because you're not really included unless you're included in that network in the organization. And we're starting to look at that and we're starting to see that historically marginalized individuals are staying marginalized. Um, so it's very important to consider what ways can we bring them out. And it's harder in a virtual environment. Uh, in a virtual environment, people rely on the usual suspects. Um, assignments go to the same places. Existing relationships are maintained. It's much harder to reach out and to get to know people. Um, so that was already going to be a challenge for people who are historically marginalized. And in this time of crisis, when we've gone remote, it's that much harder to initiate and develop our networks. I get contacted all the time by people wanting to know how to build relationships and network in this virtual environment. Um, what we find too is that historically marginalized individuals, and by that I mean um, people who have been underrepresented in organizations, women, people of color, um, uh, veterans, um, people of different uh, abilities, um, Gen sexual orientation, there's lots of different ones and there's certainly overlapping ones. Women of color have a particular experience, for instance, that's different um, from white women and from men of color. Um, but some of those voices that hadn't been brought into the conversation, now that we're in a virtual environment, are getting even quieter. Uh, and it's harder and harder to hear their voices and have them to bear on organizational issues. And that matters a lot, not just for those individuals, but for the organization. The whole point of diversity is to have diverse perspectives to bear on organizational issues. You want to be more creative. You want to have better decision making. And we know those things are related to having more diverse perspectives. So this is a real um, challenge, not just for individuals interested in sort of the social aspects of this, but for individuals interested in the bottom line effects. Um, we do have some pluses. 
um, in that uh, many of those very important micro bonding moments, the chit chat in the hallway, the after work drink and things like that, which often uh, very subtly, and again, you know, not intentionally, um, but very subtly um, occur more often among the historically overrepresented groups. Those aren't happening, right? Because we're all locked up in our homes now. So there's very little opportunity for those things. So that's good. And in some way, it levels the playing field a little bit. But we also see popping up more virtual private spaces, Facebook places, um, different sort of um, social groups. And it's what they call frictionless to exclude in that setting um, so that there's a lot less you have to deal with on a regular basis, and people, people don't even know they're being uh, left out of those kinds of conversations. So there's some real challenges that um, are going through here. Um, I want to dive a little bit into that, um, you know, who's in your network, the strength and the structure a bit, just to sort of point out the challenges. Um, the people who are in your network matter a lot for the kind of resources and information that you have access to. People from historically underrepresented groups far more likely to connect with people like them because that's what we do when we're left to our own devices. Lots of science supports that. People from historically overrepresented groups do the same thing. Very natural. We all do it. We like hanging around with people who are like us. It's a little bit more comfortable. The problem is, you can guess, right? If you're from a historically underrepresented group, you hang out with people like you, you are oversampling from the historically underrepresented group. Therefore, compared to people who from the historically overrepresented group, you're far less likely to be connected to more senior people, more people in positions of power, more people with influence, people who can uh, open doors, who can put you on high visibility projects, who can bring you out into new clients. Um, so there's, a, there's always been a, a big difference in that. I just did a, some work not long ago with a West Coast company um, and we took a look at uh, women and their connections to more senior executives. And we found that uh, at every level in the organization, men were far more connected to senior executives than were women. And it was a real surprise to the organization because they, they didn't know that that had been going on. Um, um, even when people from historically underrepresented groups are able to form those relationships, maybe through a, a sponsorship program or a mentorship program, they're far less likely to have strong relationships. And that's how trust is built. Um, you're just a little bit more distant. Um, you're just uh, a little more formal uh, in the way you relate to that person. They find out just a little bit less about you and your aspirations and what you want to do and your interests and your abilities. Um, so you're not able to leverage that relationship like somebody who's from a historically overrepresented group can do. And finally, we're finding that the structure of networks um, also is different. So there's particular structures that are really advantageous. And a big one, if you've read my book, you know, uh, is that one that forms bridges between different groups in an organization. Um, and it turns out that some people are treated differently when they occupy that position. So I, I, most of my research is around women. And I can tell you that when women occupy that position, they, are, they often get some backlash. Uh, it's a little too agentic, a little too take charge of a position. Um, and so they get some backlash and that people sort of resent them a little bit for that. So there are already some disadvantages that um, people from historically underrepresented groups have when they enter into um, uh, relationship building. Uh, here's just a little more detail. Uh, I love this study here on the right where um, they, they were interested in understanding, it's a little old, but they were interested in understanding the strategies that different um, race, women of different race ethnicities uh, used when building their network. And there's some advantages to blending in and having a, a network that's filled with people from the historically overrepresented group. And there's some advantages to sticking together, um, to staying, to forming relationships with people who are more like you. The blending in is, a, is advantageous in terms of moving you through the organization and power and status. The sticking together gives you emotional support um, and can also provide very strong bonds to help you get um, uh, through the organization. 
Um, and you can see here in this study, they found that Asian women and Latinas had very different strategies than African-American women did. It's not to say that one's better or worse, it kind of depends on the organization, but that it's worth understanding um, that there are differences and why those differences exist and that they might be problematic for people either because they're going to feel that they don't truly fit in and belong because there's not many people here like me or they're going to feel uh, isolated and cut off from the rest of the organization. Um, there are things that organizations can do to shake that up uh, there are things that individuals can do, and there's things that organizations can do. So for instance, what we know is that when people get to know each other and they know each other's abilities, they'll start forming relationships. Um, but if we're left to our own devices, we kind of drift into being with people like us, which is why, for instance, women tend to drift into uh, human resources um, and some of the and marketing to some extent. Um, they get sort of pulled in by other women and other social things that are going on. So a very easy thing that organize, well, a thing that organizations can do is that they can start getting people working together in different ways. So a couple of organizations that I've spoken to have done gig rotations. So um, internal to the organization, you might post a job, you might say it's gonna take five to hours, 10 hours, you know, 30 hours over six months or whatever. People can apply for it. It's an expectation in your professional development. And then you do these gigs and people see how you work and you get exposure in a way that you might not be getting that exposure if you were actually sort of applying for another position within the organization. So that's sort of a simple way to, that people can do it. You, there's also all kinds of stuff you can do with restructuring, um, not you know, changing the, or, the formal hierarchy, but the way you're structuring teams and the way the work is being put together. So yeah, it's a natural tendency and organizations have to do a lot to combat it. Uh, they have to raise awareness uh, because it's some of it is on us, um, but they also have to change systems because um, a lot of it is um, driven by the system itself. But yeah, there's stuff we can do, but we, we can't change the fundamental tendency. There's something to be said for that, um, and I think that that can um, be supported with sort of targeted leadership training. But there's a flip side to that. I, women have a penalty uh, when they when they promote too much. Um, they're seen as being too assertive and too aggressive, and so some of the behaviors that uh, men would do, the exact same behaviors done by a woman, come across very differently. Um, so there's there's sort of two sides to that. Um, but for sure, um, and women tend to connect with other people, um, not all women, just sort of on average, um, around sort of uh, social kinds of things. So in the workplace, it might be really common to connect around kids uh, or um, uh, activities outside of work. Um, it's not always, but that, that is a common way to do it. Um, and so you have less opportunity to talk about your work and talk about yourself. Um, if you want to get into this sort of socialization argument, um, we are socialized to be more communal, uh, whereas men are socialized to be more agentic, take charge. Um, and so women are supposed to want to be on the same level as everybody else, so not to disrupt that harmony of um, unevenness. So we'll, we'll sort of downplay things that we did. We don't want to self-promote. Oh, thank you for the compliment, but really it's, it's, it was nothing, you know, it was, it was not a big deal. Um, those are some socialization tendencies. Um, and then when people act contradictory to them, they get some pushback on that. So I absolutely think it's um, hard for women and it's hard for them in learning to sort of promote themselves but they're not gonna get the same response if they try the same strategies as men. They have to do different strategies. Um, and there also has to be some education for everyone uh, to understand um, different styles and provide people with opportunities in which they feel comfortable demonstrating their abilities. But yeah, absolutely. It, it's, um, I think a lot of organizations try to take the easy route um, and they say, well, we'll appoint somebody, uh, chief global diversity officer, 
Um, they're going to handle all that problem. I don't know what they're going to do, but they're just going to handle that problem over there. And they'll do some implicit bias training and, you know, they'll have some stuff on how like we're all different and here's how we're different. And they'll have some cultural affirmation things and then we'll celebrate, you know, different cultures and things like that. But the real hard work of um, having conversations that are uncomfortable, um, the hard work of um, the fear that we all live in that we're going to say the wrong thing uh, and learning to step into that fear um, and um, on both sides, whether you're helping somebody manage their fear or you're managing your own fear, um, I think that's really hard work and takes a deep commitment um, from the very top of the organization. The organizations that I see fail at this don't have a strong commitment at the top. Yeah, and, and to, to be fair, most organizations, when I talk to them, I talked to a large consulting firm not long ago, um, <clears throat> excuse me, and they have a number of uh, employee resource groups. So they have one that's focused on women and women's issues, but they also have one that's focused on cross-cultural issues and people who um, were born from in different nationalities. Um, I can tell you that a um, lot, a lot of research, a lot of cross-cultural research says that when we are you know, putting people in boxes when we are doing what we just naturally do and trying to understand the person in front of us and, or, and when we first meet them, the two biggest ways that we look at people are through the lens of gender and through race, ethnicity. Slightly less important, but also important is age. So in a very quick snapshot of time, you can tell if uh, what the gender of somebody is um, you can tell, um, you can have an opinion about their skin color in terms of light or dark, uh, and then also if they're young or old. Then there's a whole other series of differences that are core or less core to your identity. And they could be, um, I, I just listened to a guy talk very um, movingly about neurodiversity um, for people whose brain wiring is different from uh, the majority of, of, of people. Um, and so for certainly national origin is part of that, um, religious, um, beliefs, I, I'm seeing more and more, um, political beliefs, um, that, uh, organizations are intentionally or unintentionally excluding people who, uh, lean one way, um, on, in their political beliefs. Um, so there's lots of different, um, buckets, but it does turn out that the primary ones, the ones that we first go to cross-culturally our gender, race, ethnicity, and then to a lesser extent, age. But I'm with you. I think absolutely all these other differences need to be celebrated. Um, and, and many organizations, certainly ones that um, are global, um, have this as part of their uh, consideration of diversity. So their employee resource groups or something like that. So our challenge is to deepen the inclusion of historically um, uh, um, marginalized individuals, particularly in this time of crisis. Um, and one solution, there's a bunch of them, and I'm just going to go into two of them, but one solution is to pull those quieter voices into team conversations. So this is coming out of a study um, I did not long ago. Um, there'll be, um, some of it's being um, published in um, uh, Sloan MIT this um, uh, this winter, I think it's coming out in the winter edition. Um, a colleague and I, we interviewed 100, 101 um, high-performing team leaders in 20 different organizations. And we interviewed each of them for about 90 minutes. And we chose people who had been identified by their organizations as having successfully led high-performing teams, multiple high-performing teams over multiple years, over at least 10 years. Um, and we asked them what they were doing. And we really dug into the practices and we just learned so much about so many different things. Um, so many different things, but one of them being inclusion. And one thing that they were doing was pulling quieter voices into team conversations. So they might start each meeting by asking everyone to answer the same question. I know I do that sometimes in the classroom. Uh, once somebody gets their voice out there once, they find it easier to get their voice out again. And I've I have, I find that happens all the time, but it's, it's overcoming that hurdle of, of speaking. 
Um, make sure you ask everybody in the meeting for their opinion at least once and acknowledge their answers. This is stuff you can do in the virtual world. Uh, it's just, it just has to be intentional. Um, when someone um, repeats an idea that was put forward earlier in the meeting, point out who shared the idea originally. You can do that very easily. You just say like, oh, that's a great idea. And you're following up on that idea that was first presented by, you know, Cara as suggested that earlier. Um, and it's just to make sure that, um, that you're not falling prey to only somebody who's got sort of higher status um, or seniority or whatever, uh, that their voice is heard more. You wanna make sure that you're, whenever those quieter voices, whenever their contributions are not recognized, you're gonna be there and point those out so that everybody around you sees them and hears them. When you notice differences, differences of opinion, draw attention to it and celebrate it. This is great. This is so good that we have different ways of approaching this problem. This is gonna mean we're gonna get a much better answer than if we weren't uh, debating these two different perspectives. Um, and make sure that you're seeing this as a positive and not a problem. And this one, I think this last one's really hard for leaders right now. There's so much time pressure on people right now. People are zoomed out. They're trying to get their work done. Everything's still moving fast, but people are juggling all kinds of stuff. There is the tendency and the desire to like want to solve a problem by getting into a small huddle. Let's just figure it out. Let's, let's just bang it out and, and do it. But those small huddles are almost certainly going to be filled with your usual suspects, um, the people that you feel already feel the most comfortable with. Um, and that's going to make it hard to build an inclusive environment because you're going to be continuing to create that gap between who's brought into the conversation and who's on the edge of the conversation. Um, and then uh, something that I try to do, but I'm always going like this, um, but you as a team leader can either assign that role to somebody uh, or you can save the chats after a Zoom and look back on them. And you just want to see who is and isn't, quote, talking. Um, this, I have, I've only seen one or two things coming up on chats, but often you'll be in a meeting and there'll be a really robust chat going on as people are discussing ideas and bouncing them off of each other. And you want to look at that. Is, are the voices, is everybody's voice being heard? Or are some people not contributing um, or not listening when there's contributions made there? So these are things you can do in the virtual environment. I'll just go through one other one. Um, and that's seeking opportunities to engage with people who are different from yourself. And again, this is in the virtual environment. Um, so leverage micro bonding moments thoughtfully. Um, the leaders that we spoke with would you know, have a 55 minute meeting and create an agenda for 45 minutes of it, but build in that slack time so that they would have opportunity to you know, ask somebody how their day was, what was going on, how was it at home when you're sort of managing the work family kind of thing. Those little moments that we find are pivotal to building relationships and relationships where people trust you. Um, and trust is key to um, promotions and job opportunities. So, Leverage those little moments. Think, be thoughtful who you're talking to. There's nudge technologies out there, um, bunch AI. There, there's a bunch of them out there um, and they'll create awareness of communication tendencies. Some of them operate through Slack. Some of them operate in other ways. And what they'll do is they'll, they'll monitor your emails. I mean, the, the to from of your emails um, at, or your Slack exchanges and will let you know, oh, you thought you were talking to everybody in the team, but actually, 60% of your conversations were really with um, people who were just like you and they only represent, you know, 10% of your team or something like that. So it can, it can help you. It just helps you monitor and it'll nudge you. You haven't spoken with so-and-so or you haven't communicated with so-and-so for a while. So these are things you can bring into the virtual world. Um, you can continue um, mentor and sponsorship relationships. Um, you set, but you'll need to set expectations regarding the purpose of the meetings and the meeting cadence. Um, usually it's a couple of meetings in the beginning and then sort of once a month, maybe once a quarter after that. Um, uh, one of the differentiators I've, we found with these leaders that we spoke with was that they were very proactive in creating opportunities to interact with people who thought differently from themselves. And now we're just not even talking about demographic diversity, but sort of functional expertise. 
And so they would calendar, <laughs> they would calendar in time to make those connections with different parts of the organizational network. People maybe who are dealing with similar problems, but in different geographies. Um, people who had similar roles, but on different types of accounts. Um, and starting to um, use that as a way of understanding different paradigms of thought. Um, and then lastly, um, I'll just leave you with this, which is we're in a time where there are huge events happening um, and in the United States, but around the world as well. Uh, we've got a pandemic that's on. We've got social unrest. We've got climate change that's wreaking havoc in terms of wildfires and drought and um, uh, hurricanes. Reach out, especially with those communities and the people who belong to those communities who are disproportionately affected. We know that Black and Latinx um, are disproportionately affected by the pandemic. We know that Asian Americans are dealing with increased incidences of racism. And we know that people uh, who are black have been emotionally torn by some of the issues and protests and the responses to them that have been raised through the hashtag Black Lives Matter um, movement. So make a point of connecting with those people a little bit more often.